Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. This is Jill. Have you ever wondered how you can tell if statistics are being used wrongly, either by choice or by accident, without really knowing more about math? That's what we'll talk about today. Facts are stubborn things, but statistics are pliable. Mark Twain. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about statistics. We're not going to really talk about the math behind the statistics. So if you don't like math or you're not really good at math, that's okay. We're really going to talk about how people either willingly or by accident use statistics in such a way they either can't be used, shouldn't be used, or are they lying if those numbers are used? Statistics are something that I think should be taught more. You know, we always talk about teaching algebra and geometry and how much people actually use that after high school. But you know what people use all the time? Statistics. Even when I was making decisions about which type of medicine to put my cats on, when I go to the doctor myself, and when I'm trying to decide which type of bank accounts I'm going to get, statistics are used to help you weigh things out. We're going to talk about some ways that statistics are used pretty much outside the bounds of how they're meant to be used so that you can go in as a better consumer and understand how the information is being presented to you, and whether or not you can really trust that information. The first basic piece of information to know, when statistics are being gathered, sometimes they're not gathered in a proper way. For example, statistics by pollsters are gathered from a place where they can pretty much guarantee a result. Maybe I want to talk about healthy behaviors, and I go to a health retreat. Are those people going to be more interested than the typical population in healthy living. Any statistics I would provide from that are already tainted because I already tainted the pool of people that I'm planning on getting information from. Not only that, sometimes when statistics are done, particularly for political purposes, they're actually from a politician themselves and they're using the statistical questions to try to lead you. Most people feel the other person is terrible. On a scale from 1 to 10, how terrible do you think that other person is? They're already giving me information. They're trying to sway my vote. And then eventually, if they get statistics out of it, it's going to be tainted statistics because everyone that gathered information will already be wrong. Well, did you know we talked to 100 people and 99% of them hate that other person? Don't vote for them. That's a bad way to use statistics, but people do it in order to gain our trust, or to say something that maybe should not be said. The next problem from statistical point of view are bad questions. And so you can basically ask a lot of bad questions intentionally or not intentionally and change the way that people read a specific statistic. Let's say I call everyone in my town and I ask a question. Would you rather ban carrots entirely or make carrots illegal with a small fine. And 97% of people say, well, I'd rather make carrots have a small fine than ban them entirely. Now I can go to the press and say, 97% of the people in this town are in favor of imposing a penalty on eating carrots. Was that true? Is that really what happened? Or did I stage a question so it made it look like what I was trying to prove? Bad questions. In a more recent example, There was an airline in the United States that did a survey, and it said that 92% of the people said that their overall experience with the airline is good. But what it turns out is that the survey never had an option for anything below okay. And so if you ask them the question, everyone gave them a very good rating because they really couldn't give a bad rating to this airline. It also can be how the question is asked what options the person was given, and then how they ended up answering it. And it's unfortunate because it's possible that people were going to give this airline a good review anyway. But as soon as you see the questions that you're asked and the numbers that you're allowed to answer, you suddenly start believing that this airline is not really asking a good question. Then the other problem comes along when you're trying to do statistics and A lot of times when people try to run surveys, polls, or experiments, and they don't get the results they want, oftentimes they just bury the whole entire study. So someone's trying to see if this particular drug cures allergies, and they find out, no, it didn't cure allergies at all. 
They don't publish those results. It didn't get the kind of details that they want. I've always been in favor of publishing all studies. I think you should publish all studies, whether you got what you want or you didn't get what you want, because it's important when we get negative results, too. Then there are other reasons why something changed. I remember seeing something about baseball and how many more home runs are being hit now than used to be hit a long time ago. When it came down to it, it's that certain things changed. The materials that the bats were being made out of, maybe there were particular changes to the way that the stadium was made. So sometimes, even if the person's trying to do a very good job, they're not putting apples to apples together. They don't really have any means to study the same thing over and over again because it's not the same thing. You know, I think throughout this entire COVID experience, there's many times where we'll say, well, that country did this and look, nothing bad happened. But maybe that country had younger people, thinner people, the lack of multi-generational living. And so we can't really compare apples to apples because they're in a situation we can't compare. Even if people are trying to do a good job or maybe they're trying to taint their data, they can't really come up with a situation that's equal. And there are ways that statisticians who are trained and know how to do that can make those things happen, but it takes someone to know what they're doing. So the first thing to understand is what exactly it means to have a study. So what you're trying to do in a study is you're trying to see Can I get a result? Maybe drug A works better than drug B. And can I prove that it works better over pure chance? So I'm going to split my people into two groups. Half of them are going to get drug A. Half of them are going to get drug B. And 65% of the people on drug B do better. Now, is it because they did better? Or is it because even random chance still would have produced that type of result? Or Is it because people in drug B had a particular trait? Maybe they were younger and were able to recover from this illness better. But that's what we're trying to figure out is so first of all, we look at the sample size. How many people are in each of the groups that we're trying to study? Do we have enough people in our study so that we can determine whether or not we're getting just a random chance of something happening? or that we exceeded expectations of just random chance. Keep in mind, it is still entirely possible to have uneven results in anything, even coin flipping, and have it still be random chance. Then the other part is that we have to see, with a bunch of formulas, what percentage of results can we get that will ensure us that we're no longer looking at chance, that we actually have a finding here. How do we know that? And so they run a bunch of formulas if they're good statisticians to know that. So when we talk about what chance is, that's called the null hypothesis. Not to get too nerdy on you, but that just means those are the results that chance would have provided. And then what we have is we look at getting above that particular chance. In the show notes, there's a couple of really great videos that talk about this. And one of them is by Jennifer Rogan. And she did a YouTube video called How Not to Fall for Bad Statistics. And she talks a little bit about this. But first of all, just know that we have to have enough people and they have to be in a group of people that were recruited randomly or statistically determined what we would recruit out of so that we can make sure we get a good result. Once we get a good pool of people, it's the proper sample size Then we know what the margin of error is so that we know what we can do to break away from what would be the random chance of this happening. Now we can have a study. Let's briefly talk about odds. Odds of things happening naturally and how we can determine if something is happening outside our expectation of natural odds or the null hypothesis. The first concept to understand is that there's a difference in probability, whether or not We are removing options as we have probabilities win or every roll has the same number of options available to them. For example, if we flip a coin 50 times, pure odds would say we're going to get 25-25, but oftentimes that's not how it works at all. We'll get 20-30, we'll get 23-27. It rarely works out 25-25, even though that's the exact concept of a 50-50 split. Each coin flip has a 50% chance of being heads or tails. But 50-50 doesn't mean that 
we're necessarily going to get a 50-50 split at the end of 50 rolls, 100 rolls. But the bigger our number gets, the more likely we're going to be pretty even in the heads and tails category. Just like if we had a 50% chance of having a boy or a girl when giving birth, having four boys in a row doesn't affect whether or not the next birth is going to be a boy or a girl. We always still have that same probability. The previous action has no bearing on the future actions. However, as we get more and more people in our survey, the odds of boy and girl, heads or tails, will always even out more towards the average. Let's say that we have 100 balls in a bin and we're going to pick one of them. Each of them has a 1 in 100 chance of being picked, except we take the ball out once the ball has been picked. So now we have 99 balls and our odds have changed in the next ball that we pick because we keep reducing the number of options that we have available to us. Statistics are very different when we're removing options versus whether or not both options or all options stay in the pool all the time. And then the other interesting thing about statistics is just make sure that you don't fall into what they call the tyranny of the averages. For example, let's say we have two little league teams and one little league team hits a lot more runs than this little league team in this other town. So can we automatically say that the first team is better than the second team? And we really can't because it's possible that first team plays easier teams. And so they get hits all the time because they don't really have much competition. Meanwhile, the second team might actually technically be a better team, but they hit less scores because they play in a harder district. So keep in mind that if two people give you averages for two separate things that are unrelated to each other, that may not mean anything when it comes to statistics. How can people use statistics when it talks about means? First of all, all statistics tend to trend towards the mean, which means that if I flipped a coin 50 times and I ended up with 20 versus 30, if I flip them another 50 times, chances are it would end up looking more normal. All statistics tend to go towards the average. So if you had a team and they had this awful losing streak, and typically they win about 60% of the games they play, unless they're really horrible, even if they drop four games in a row, chances are they're going to go more towards their average in the next games. Could have been bad luck, could have been just bad gaming, could have been just people weren't doing what they needed to do, but they will tend to go towards their average naturally. So a lot of times when you see a team and they fire their coach and immediately a new coach comes in and just starts doing amazingly well, we don't really know at that point, was it something that the coach did differently or was the team regressing or moving towards their average anyway? It always looks good for that new coach, but is it a real improvement? Maybe not. A newspaper will run a big story or even the local news and they will say that we found out that drinking diet soda causes cancer. This was a big one when I was a kid. And it turned out that it was the equivalent of a thousand cans of pop a day that they were giving to mice. And sure, it might not be good for you, but you had to drink an extraordinary amount of diet pop to get the results they were getting in that. So oftentimes when you look at a study, you'll find out that it was in a mouse it was in a different situation that you could possibly ever use this product. So that's a warning sign for how it's used. And there's a whole Twitter feed out there called In a Mouse. So they only list studies that the news, either in print or on television, will report out to people with great excitement and it'll say In a Mouse. So can I look at that statistic and say it's relevant to me or is it just relevant to a mouse? Hard to tell, but we certainly want to take a look at those conditions. It may be that a particular drug does something that it was supposed to do, even though it was in a mouse and it works for us too, but it may be entirely not true for you. So my challenge to you is try to notice in this next week how many times people give you statistics. Then I want you to take a look at it and just think logically, 
are there ways that the statistics I was given about a certain thing, could they be wrong or could they be right? And see if you can see a little bit behind what's going on that's being given to you. And now our fun entertainment quote of the week comes from the movie Gifted. I beg your pardon? What kind of school is this anyway? It's the kind of school where students don't speak without permission. All right, but everyone knows it's six. Nobody in this classroom speaks unless they are called upon. Okay, is everybody clear on that? Yes, ma'am. Good. Mary, can you stand up, please? Stand on up. Stand up, babe. These questions are for you because you're so advanced. What is nine plus eight? 17. Yeah, yes, it is. That's good. What is 15 plus 17? 32. Yeah, that's, that's, that is right. All right, then. Well, what is 57 plus 135? 192. Yeah. Uh-huh. Can you tell me what 57 multiplied by 135 is? Okay. Who can tell me what for? 7,695. The square root is 87.7. Then change. Now what does ad nauseum mean? Boy, she sure is smart. But I'll tell you that even people who are great at math sometimes aren't very good at statistics and can be fooled just the same way. Statistics is a special thing all to itself. And hopefully she doesn't fall for clickbait headlines. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And I know a lot of people out there don't like math, but I hope you found this helpful. Have a wonderful week.